We're going to talk about content marketing this morning. I guess it's my job to sort of kick this whole thing off and to set the concept, and we've got some wonderful speakers to talk to you the rest of the day. Just some, some detail on you know, what we do, founder of uh, the Content Marketing Institute. There's a couple different things, part of the institute. Uh, one is a magazine called Chief Content Officer. It's actually just hot off the presses, if anybody wants to see it. It's right here. There's the book that you were so nice to, to mention as well. Where's a, who's got a camera? Who's taking pictures? Oh, I just get a shot of it. You get that? Just want to make sure you get that. Uh, the people at McGraw-Hill will be happy. We can spread that around the internet a little bit. So on the agenda. So we'll talk about you know, what is this whole thing called content marketing? Who's doing it? Uh, what are people spending on it? But this is actually the first presentation like this I've done. And what I like to do is set the stage and say, OK, what is content marketing? And so you have a feel for what we're talking about. And everybody's on the same page. And then I'm going to go through 10 reasons why your content might actually stink and things that you can do to improve that. So we'll have a little, bit of, um, a little bit of helpful resources there at the end, and we'll have some fun as well. I want you to think about this question, are you a publisher? When we talk about content marketing, we talk about the idea of us being publishers. But when you think about publishers, what do you think of? So just, you, does somebody say, you can say, yeah, throw it out. Hey, we've got an active audience, let's do it. Condé Nast? Magazine publisher, anything else? Newspapers? Sort of. Facebook. Sort of. Hey, there you go. Let's go through some of them. You might think of book publishing, right? I don't know why I took this really old picture. But <laughs> good think of book publishing. And when you say book publishing, you know, what, what are you thinking about? Um, so we've got you know, McGraw-Hill, Wiley, Prentice Hall, Random House, book publishers. And then you go on, somebody mentioned magazine publishers. And when you say magazines, what are you thinking about? So you've got your trade publications like, um, whatever, speed and sound there. You've got uh, the this, uh, women's publications like Elle and Self and, well, I don't want to say it's women's. There might be some guys that are into that too. <laughs> but you've got different magazine publishers and then you move on. You say, well, you've got web publishers. Facebook could be part of that. When you think of web publishers, pure online publishers, you might think of like the Huffington Post, for example, or something like Mashable or iVillage or Harvard Business Publishing that have their online components or advertising age with their online publishing resources. So when you think about all that, you say, OK, well, yeah, that's publishing. But let's look at a definition of what publishing really is. Process of production and the dissemination of information. And when you take that information and you make it public, you are now a publisher. Boy, so that's like pretty broad definition, right? So we, we tend to, when we think of publishing, we put it in these little buckets of what a publisher means to us. But really, when we talk about publishing, and anybody can be a publisher. We talk about this in the book. And Russell, you were so nice to, to mention all the, the good things that uh, you got out of that. So you and five other people. Uh, no, actually, the book's done fairly well. But uh, when you talk about the barriers to entry with publishing, that's the difference today. If you were to go back 20 years and you said, well, how can I be a publisher? It's hard. Hard to do that. We had technology barriers. Actually going and creating a database, names of people to send your information to was very, very expensive to do. Most people could not afford the processes to do that. Today, that technology, anybody can be a publisher. You can start a blog today and be publishing. Uh, when you talk about content acceptance, this is very important. And I think Facebook and Twitter and those um, types of online tools have helped with that. If you think about people accepting content, people are much more accepting of content coming from you, whereas in the past they might have said, well, you know, if it's Wall Street Journal or New York Times or your trade magazine, say, oh, that's good content. Well, if you're a blogger today, that's good content as well, and people are very accepting of that. Technology, talent availability. Very important to look at the fact that there are tons of journalists out there that will, will help you and help any company create a good story. And we all need that, right? So there's not that barri those barriers to entry anymore. So if you think about what you do as a company, let me take a side um, step for a second just so I get a feel for who's here. Who would consider themselves a small business owner or part of a small business? So most of your small business, mid-size, any mid-size businesses? Okay, mid-size large, okay. So we've got mostly small businesses and maybe like 10, 20%. So this is really good to, if you think about 
what our job is when we are publishing. So think about what a publisher does and what you do in your marketing. And basically think about it from this magnet. We're using all these tools and all this stuff to make us interesting so people actually want to engage with us. Publishers need to do it and we need to do the same thing, but there is a difference. So think about it from this perspective. What is the real difference? What is the only difference between a marketer and a publisher? And there's only one. Some people, and, and if you think about putting that, those ideas of what a publisher is away, book publishing, magazine publishing, web pub, put those away. I know you think there is no difference. <laughs> so we'll get to that in a second. So if you, if you think about the only difference, there is really only one difference. And I, everybody see this movie, City Slickers? We have Curly up there, and, and they ask him, uh, you know, what is the, what, what's the meaning of life? And he says, there's just that one thing, one thing. And that's the same thing in this situation. There's only one thing, and that's money. How we get the money for the content that we create. Let me expand on that so you understand. So everything a publisher does and everything you do in your small, medium, and large-sized businesses to market today is the same. There's no difference. The difference is a publisher creates content to get money specifically on that content. Paid content, they will sell the content, or they will um, create sponsorship opportunities and advertising opportunities around that content. You as a small, medium, large size business, or let's say with the arts, where you're trying to get members, you're creating content to do something to then get you money in the back end. So let's say that's to you know, sell more products and services. So you're not directly making money off of that, but you're selling goods and services. You're getting more members for your association. That's the only difference. This was an article that was just in a really good uh, online publication called Marketing Sherpa. They did an interview. So, just, just. so it says, the only difference is that a media company leverages content to sell paid sponsorships and content. And we as businesses do it to sell products and services or an association case grow membership. So that's the, that's the only difference. And if you think about it from that perspective, and I know a lot of people think, well, publishing is old school, it's old world, but publishing has never been more in vogue than it is right now because of all the things we just talked about. So I want you to look at this chart for a second. And this is a um, study that we, that Marketing Profs and Junta42, um, one of our companies did. And we looked, we talked to a thousand different marketers and we said, what are you doing in content marketing? What's going on in content marketing? And if you look at all these things, 79% are using social media, 78% articles, 62% in-person events, 61% um, e-newsletters, case studies, blogs. I mean, look at all this stuff. You know what all that is? It's publishing. That's all publishing. And if you looked at that and I told you, no, that's, that's what publishers do, you'd probably say, oh, absolutely. Of course, they're doing in-person events, they're doing e-newsletters, they're doing all that to make money off of their content. But in your case, it's the same thing. We're just doing it for different reasons. Because this is the only definition slide I have. I uh, promise you. Oh, the, the second, I had another one, I lied. But here's, an, here's the last one. So let me give you a formal definition of content marketing. Content marketing is marketers as publishers. It's the idea that we own our own media channels versus renting our own media channels. I'll give you an example. Let's say, let's go old school for a second like we did with our launch of our magazine and say you want to launch a print magazine. The difference of owning your channel, you're launching your own magazine versus renting the media, I'm going to put an ad in somebody else's magazine. So it's the idea that I can create my own valuable content, send that out, create engagement, do whatever goals I needed to do for my marketing versus, you know, that, uh, let's say, Fast Company or L Magazine or whatever, that's, you know, really, really good content and I'm going to wrap my ad around it because I like that content and I like the engagement they're getting there. So it's a little different. And if you look at it, a good friend of mine, Jeff Roars uh, from Exact Target, will say it's renewable marketing. It's renewable. It keeps working for you. Worth versus uh, anybody do uh, pay-per-click? Pay-per-click advertising in here? Small business, big. Uh, versus it's the idea of pay-per-click versus search engine optimization. Create content for search engine optimization that people can find you naturally you don't have to pay for it every time. You pay for the investment up front in the asset versus pay-per-click. One click, you're done. You never see that investment again. Hopefully, you got some money out of it. Anybody who's seen any presentations I've ever done, I always get Legos in there. I'm a, I'm a Lego fanatic. My kids love Legos. 
I have actually, um, I've cut my foot, bottom of my foot, quite a few times from stepping on Legos. <laughs> Uh, so we've got them all over the house. And sweeping is actually a really fun activity. Hopefully they actually suck in rather than spitting out and breaking something. So um, I want to tell you a little bit of story about Lego. And it starts with, this, is, this happened right before um, the holidays. So this magazine, Lego Club. Anybody get Lego Club magazine? Kids? Yeah. They're very good. Yeah. Do you get it for yourself, John, or do you get it? <laughs> Somebody's got to get. Somebody's got to tweet that out. That is fantastic. So um, we received that at the house. It wasn't for me. Um, my both my sons, Joshua is nine and Adam is seven, and they both have a subscription to Lego Club magazine. Joshua gets the Brickmaster version. Adam gets the the separate version. So um, this magazine came, and if you see on the cover, I don't know if you can make that out, but that's a new line called Ninjago. That the, and it's, it's all about uh, these Legos that you can play a game with. It's called Spinjitzu, and I'll go through it anyways. <laughs> so um, it came. So this is the magazine. They subscribe to it. It's Lego's own magazine. It sends it to the kids. And so a series of events happen once they get this. They get the magazine, and Joshua reads it cover to cover. By the way, when it does come in the mail, they get ex they're really super excited. They're jumping up and down. Oh, my gosh, it came, it came. And they go, and they actually, I should have put a picture in here, they actually lay out, like, they'll lay out on the kitchen floor, and they'll, they'll both be reading it together side by side. It's really, really cute. Joshua gets it. First thing he does, reads it, and then he goes online to Ninjago.com. So he goes, and he goes and checks it out, and they've got some wonderful content on here. They talk about what it is, the history of it. They tell a whole story, the backstory of it. So we know, like, sense, I know, like Sensei Wu and Carl's the red one. He's really cool. And all the stuff that we find out from the kids. And then they've got some FAQs and stories that they're working on about the creators of the product. And then they've got Spinjitsu training classes from the master senseis. And they go through it, and they'll show you how to spin it. Because the whole idea is you put the little Lego figure on top of, it's basically a big Lego top. And then you spin them around. I probably don't have the technique right. So they spin them around, and then they, they spin next to each other, and then they both have a weapon, and the one that knocks the other one off is the winner, and you go through the whole thing. It's very addictive. I haven't won yet. I don't know what is there. Like, why can't a kid continually beat me at spinjitsu? Anyway, so it goes through the training classes, and by the way, Joshua is engaging in all this stuff. And then they've got these game, cool games on there, four pass, all this publishing, by the way. All oh, they're publishing really, really good content. And oh, by the way, they got a series on Cartoon Network, which is... Friday 14, okay, is that tomorrow? So we got that, uh, they got that direct TV about the master of Spinjitsu, so we're watching that. I'm sure we've already got that recorded on Cartoon Network, so it'll be ready to go. And then, oh, by the way, uh, they've been doing this for a long, long time. This is uh, the, the premiere copy of Brick, uh, what is it called? Brick Kicks, and actually, I received this. So I've been, uh, so that's how geeky I am. And I've been, I've been following Lego for a long time. But that talks about the consistency. And when we talk about content marketing, it's the idea of we attract and retain customers, like Lego's doing, with valuable content, compelling content, that is consistent and does something. Let me tell you what it does, because I can't tell you how much the kids bought, because all their gift certificates that they got to Toys R Us went to this product. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of dollars of stuff that they bought, Spinjitsu. They ended up taking a lot of the presents they got back from grandparents, returning it to Toys R Us and trading it in for this stuff. But let's look at the publishing empire of Lego. Look at all the stuff that they're doing. They've got, of course, different versions of magazines that they do, the website content, email newsletter. They've got branded music that they do. These club meetings are fantastic, especially for you small business owners. You know, in-person meetings are very powerful. They've got a Comcast channel that they have videos, social network, they are a full-blown publisher. So here's what it did for Lego. Um, since they've been doing all this, they've been doing it for a long time, but they've really started to fine-tune the integration of print, event, and online. And in a very tough year for toy companies, they were up um, 18%. And this is not just, you know, it's not just Lego, it's not just big business, I don't want to give you that. Uh, but if you look at the well-known companies like P&G, been doing it for a long time. This one up here, homemadesimple.com. It's basically a site for uh, people that want to know how do I do recipes on the go, 
and how can I keep an organized kitchen? And they've got over six million people that opt into that. And what I'd like to get people to think about when you, you look at something like that, is that that's six million people raising their hands and saying, yes, I want to get your marketing. Our marketing's so good, we don't think it's marketing. Same way a B2B company called Crown Peak, over 100,000 downloads of a little pocket-sized content management series. It's just a little ebook, so it doesn't have to be huge like Lego's doing. It could be one or two things that make an impact in your business. They've had millions of dollars in business. I talked to the, uh, Rob Rose, who's the former VP of marketing. I said, tell me, what's the performance of that pocket guide that you created? And he said, something like a gajillion percent. Because I think he paid like $10,000 for the whole program, and they actually had an ROI of millions of dollars. So if you think about it from that perspective, it's pretty darn amazing. And then um, Kevin Lund, this is actually his magazine that he does for TD Ameritrade called Think Money. And they have over 90% of those readers directly acted on information in the magazine. So it's the idea we're creating content, but we're not selling ads around it. We're not getting our sponsors to that. We're trying to get them to do something that's going to move our business. So great. We're all becoming the media. Anybody know this gentleman, Seth Godin? Seth Godin. Hey, Seth Godin said it, so we're good to go. He said content marketing is the only marketing left. So I'm like, whew, good thing. Now Seth says, says it. We're, we're good to go. Everything is right with the world. And if you look at that research study again, 88% of us in this room are doing some sort of content marketing. So that's fantastic. And the growth of search engine optimization, where you're found in sites like Google, and then you know you want to generate leads for your business. And then this whole thing called social media and all those tools we're using for social, it all means one thing. We've got to create better stories. We've got to tell better stories so that people find us interesting so we can move our business. And now we know that about a quarter of all budgets, are, that marketing budgets, are spent on this type of stuff. And I actually see that growing to something like you know, 30, 40, 50% over the next five years. And I don't see why it won't. Because the, the companies or the, the consumers that we're dealing with are so inundated with 3,000 plus marketing messages a day, hard to get their attention. If we're going to get their attention, better be some darn good stuff. And it, even if you look at, this is an e-marketer study that said, you know, 73% are using branded content in their social media. Very important. More than 50% of people are spending more money. So we're spending more. So everything is right with the world, right? We're like, so we're, this is like awesome. Everything is working great. But I always have, so I'm trying to build it up. Well, let's go back. Everything is awesome. It's wonderful. Life is great. But, right? But here's the problem. There is more bad, crappy content out there than ever before, and it's growing every day. And Bill Gates was not right when he said in, in two, I think it was 2004, that we'd see the end of spam in two years. We actually see more spam that are like 98% or 99% of all the email is spam. And this is the proof of that. This is part of the study. We call this the confidence gap. So take all those things that we just talked about. They were doing, using social media. They're using e-newsletters. They're using blogs. So it's great. We're all doing this stuff. And we're all figuring out how we can tell our stories and tell them and use all these bright, shiny objects like Facebook and Twitter and send out our stuff. But what we found is, look at this top one. So of the people, of those 80% of you that use social media as part of your business, 69% of you feel you're ineffective at doing it. That's what this test. So if you go down the chart, it'll say 69% not doing a good job at social media and content. 60% not doing a good job at blogs. Not doing a good job at videos. Not doing a good job at anything. So they're using all this stuff, but we're, doing, we're not doing a good job. We don't know how to measure it. We can't get integrated into our companies. We can't figure out how to do it. So we got a problem. So everything's great. We've got, every, we've got a blank canvas in front of us to do whatever we need to do in storytelling, but most of us are, are not doing a good job. So to the end part of the presentation here, and this is, the, this will have some fun with this, but this is the 10 reasons why your content stinks, and we're going to give you some ideas on how to fix it. Some of these are very, very basic. So if you don't know anything about content marketing or never heard the term before, who, um, who's heard of content marketing before seeing the promotion that Russell put together? So you've heard of it. Who did not? I won't put, so it's the other people that did not. That's okay. <laughs> you know, that would have put you on the spot. 
you know, it's funny, like two years ago, there was nobody. Nobody ever, this is a brand new thing and we've, uh, even though, by the way, this has been going on for hundreds of years. This is not anything new. Um, John Deere had a publication called The Furrow that they used to send to farmers in the late 1800s and it used to tell them how to, and teach them how to farm better. And that's still going on today, over 110 years of, of wonderful magazines that they put together. Okay, so number one, reason why your content stinks and what you can do about it, you don't have the right goals. You don't have, I see this all the time. You ever see, uh, talk to a CEO who used to sell magazines. They used to work at a publishing, trade publishing company called Pent Media. They used to sell magazines. Uh, and then we used to put custom magazines together for big publishers. And when we used to go in and talk to the marketing manager, and this actually happened in a couple situations, said, so what's the objective? What are you trying to do with your custom magazine? He said, well, the CEO wants it. <laughs> Say, okay, as long as you got money, we'll do it. But not, not a good way to go, and we see that all the time. So look at what the goals are usually of, you know, content marketing. You get to attraction, retention, you know, you're trying to end world hunger, you know, whatever you're trying to do. Somebody thought it would be cool, the CEO wants it. Boy, I've heard it all when it comes to content marketing goals. Here's the problem. We're trying to do too much, and we're trying to show return on investment, ROI, whatever we're trying to do. It's very tough when we're like, oh, we're, you know, we're trying to do everything with one thing. So what I'm going to tell you, the best way to go is figure out what that ultimate goal is. Is this a retention? You're trying to retain customers, trying to nurture your customers. Are you trying to generate new leads with this? Figure out that because once you figure out what that objective is, then you can figure out how to measure it. It's not rocket science. Just figure out what's the goal and then how we can measure it. I'll give you a couple examples. This is Altair Engineering, a small business in the design engineering field. They actually put the majority of their marketing spend in a magazine called Concept to Reality. And they send it out to half prospects, well, for the most part, prospects and then some of their customers. But their goal was no, but no CEOs knew about them. And they said, this is a CEO buy, it's a C-level buy. How do we get their attention in manufacturing companies? And they said, you know, we came up with the idea of doing this magazine, Concept to Reality. And what they started to do, they started to get, that magazine was then passed down to engineers in those manufacturing companies. They started to get calls. And their point is to get, to get calls, to get noticed, to get on the radar. And that's what they were end up, ended up doing. They did it two times a year. Anybody get Corvette Quarterly magazine? What's the goal of Corvette Quarterly Magazine? Sell cars to who? Their, whole, their real goal is to sell Corvettes to Porsche owners. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, it works. It works. Because what they want to do, they want to focus on, okay, who's driving a sports car that is not a Corvette? And they get that database, and then they send them Corvette Quarterly. So that's their goal. So if you think about, try to think about, okay, what are your goals for your content marketing goals? So it might be brand awareness, and that's tough to measure, but these other ones are really good to measure. Customer retention, loyalty, you can measure those things. Lead gen, measure. Recruiting new customers. Website traffic, tough goal. This is a, and then according to the study, because eh, you know, traffic, what does that really tell you? Thought leadership, sales, we know we can measure. Lead quality, those types of things we can measure. So one thing that Lego's really good at, if you're thinking about when you put together any content, it's not just mag use magazine samples, we'll use some other samples in a second. But if you think about when you put together your content, I want you to think of when I put together a story for my email marketing, for my social media, for whatever stories I'm trying to tell to get attention, what's your call to action? Do you have a call to action? Are you telling them to do something? Do you want them to take some type of behavior? Lego does this really, really well. Because at the bottom of every page of all their comics, they're telling them to go somewhere, do something, get more information, sign up for this, do this. They don't do it heavy handed either. And they think you can go overboard and say, sell, sell, sell. It's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to say, hey, if you really like this information, here's some more stuff. If you like the 10 tips for, you know, how to get more out of your arts and education experience, which I'm trying to make it relevant to you. Uh, you know, then you can give them more information. Like, if you really like this, here's another ebook. Here's another course. Here's a webcast. Here's a webinar that can help you. That's why it's got to be integrated together, your whole program, and that's what we're getting to as, as publishers. 
Number two reason why your content stinks, I see this all the time with small businesses. I got a good example for you. Your content is about everything. It's not niche enough. I love this example. I don't know, this, maybe this is just me. This is Sinclair Heating, Cooling, and Plumbing. Uh, we got a couple businesses in HVAC, so we track these guys. So I love Sinclair because they're doing a blog. Fantastic. You know what they're blogging about? Breadsticks. That's what I want. I want to know the guy that's going to switch out my air conditioning unit. You know what? Uh, what kind of a seasoning you put on those breadsticks? That's what I want to know, right? And they have a, they have a recipe of the month. What, why? It doesn't position you as an expert, position you as a thought leader, drive your business. You think anybody else signs up for this because they want to get recipes? So think about that. They're, they're blogging about everything. They're, they're attracting all kinds of, of people that aren't their customers. So I want you to get super, super niche, and I'm gonna give you an example. So let's say you're in the pet industry, and this happens all the time, and I've seen it with big, big companies um, where they will go together and say, oh, well, we're in pet supplies, so we're just gonna create content about pets, anything about pets, pet supplies, pet problems, pet health, pets. It's not gonna work, too broad because people want it personal, they want it relevant. So what do we need to do? So think about something like issues pertaining to pet owners who like to travel with their dogs. That's pretty niche, right? Like who would talk about that? Well, believe it or not, there's a magazine called Fido Friendly and that's exactly what they do. <laughs> exactly what they do. Then that's what I want you to do. So if you figure out what your small business, what your medium sized business, what your large business, with a large business, by the way, use large uh, business folks, you would need multiple content strategies because you have multiple customer bases. Small business, probably not. You probably need one content strategy would do it. But figure out what that niche is. Number three reason why your content stinks, it's all about you, you, and more of you. <laughs> right? Don't you see this all the time? <laughs> I'm so awesome. You're going to love my content because I'm so awesome. Awesome, awesome. Now, you think that only small businesses make this mistake. Well, you probably don't. You know that large brands make this mistake. And although Ford, I've got no issues with Ford, by the way. My dad worked at Ford for 25 years. I used to drive Fords. Lots of good people at Ford. And actually, Ford's real done, made a nice turnaround. So this is from 2007, but it's a really good example about what the bad things they were doing and how they're, they're improving. This is a... Um, spread from my Ford magazine that I received while I was driving my Ford Taurus. So it's great. Hey, they're sending me a magazine. That's great. It's probably custom, you know, customer retention loyalty program. So when I, every three years in general, we get new cars. It's like, hey, buy another Ford, right? All the places that have little highlights there, that's everywhere where they mention Ford or a Ford brand. So let's say you're opening this up and you see it's like, Wow, that's fantastic. I'm really going to love this content. It's all about Ford. Ford is great. Ford is good. Ford is fantastic. There's 17 content sections in this magazine that I counted. And of the 17, Ford is mentioned in the title or first sentence of 14 of them. Yeah. Hello, Ford owner. Ford is awesome. Ford is good. You should buy more Fords. Pass it around. Spread it. Ford is a sporty car. Serious smarts. You know what? Who cares? Nobody cares. And that's, we, as business owners, we, we think our product is so good and our service is so good, we like, we want to tell everybody, and that's great. But we got to realize that nobody's going to talk about it, nobody's going to engage in it, it's just going to be a waste of money. So if you want to be the trusted expert in your niche, if you want to be the solutions provider, you have only two choices. And if somebody else has a third choice, I've been asking crowds all over the world and nobody's come up with one yet. You can either give them relevant, compelling information on a consistent basis or you can show them a good time. <laughs> one or the other. Or both together. But that's pretty much it. So that's your choice. So when you think about putting your content plans together and telling your stories, you either want to be informative, entertaining, or hopefully both. So how do you do that? So hopefully this is working, right? We're doing a little problem, a little solution. So this is all about listening. How do we understand what our, I like to say, our customers' pain points? What are our customers' pain points? Think about 
So especially small business, I'm a small business, I completely get all you small business owners. You're up at night trying to figure out, oh, how am I gonna make payroll? Um, how are we gonna get more people into the store, on my website, and all this stuff? You wanna start thinking about what are, my, what are keeping my customers up at night? What are those challenges? Whatever keeps your, what's keeping your customers up at night? What are their pain points? What's driving them crazy? Whatever that is, that's probably what we should be focused on from a content perspective. And how do you do that, right? You can listen uh, on Twitter and Facebook. That's amazing right now, all the information that we can get. You know, 20 years ago, we'd have to pay a lot of money to get this research. Today, no formal research, we can get it. You can do keyword analysis. You can use a survey, a survey tools like Zoomerang or SurveyMonkey and about a thousand other tools, free tools online you could use. Um, talk to salespeople, talk to your salespeople. What are they hearing, right? Um, talk to your employees, what are they hearing? And come up with kind of the, I mean, people call it like a buyer persona. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that term, but putting together what are the needs of the buyer and then how can we solve those needs through not our product. We know that our product solves needs. Well, first of all, if your product doesn't solve needs, then probably have, that's a whole other session. <laughs> We're gonna all move out and go do something else. But if your product's good, you know it's good, your service is really good, then we've gotta figure out how we can sell with the stories that we tell, with the content that we create. Number four reason why our content stinks and what to do about it. Good enough is not good enough anymore. I wanna make the point this way. So let's say, I don't know if you've heard of uh, software provider called SAS, SAS. So in the manufacturing space, SAS competes with the folks like IBM, SAP, and Oracle. So that's their competitive set. And when I go talk to you know, VP marketing and sales at these companies, when they do a competitive analysis, they actually do a competitive analysis. They say, okay, so, so SAS would say, oh, IBM, Oracle, and SAP, and that's what they're doing, and that's how we position ourselves against them, and have all really pretty, pretty charts, and we clap, and it's very nice. So great, but if you think about it from a content perspective, they're competing with everything in the manufacturing space. Let's say it's lean manufacturing. They're competing with Industry Week Magazine, Yahoo, Harvard Business Publishing, Facebook, Google, the, all the blogs that are in that section too. So here's the deal. Your content can't just be better than your competitors. It has to be better than everything else out there, as good or better. And, and this is why we're talking about, hey, it's great, we can do all this stuff now, but most of the stuff we produce is really bad. So we've got to figure out how we can really take, start thinking like a publisher and do the, or like you could say, like a journalist, start doing these things. E-Marketer says that great content is four things. Unique, useful or fun, well executed, and matches the media channel. Those four things that you really have to think about. So I'm gonna give you some ideas here, some samples that you can play with and, and take what, what works for you. Um, we've been talking about this for a long time. Does your content have a point of view? Does it stand for something? Does anybody know this gentleman, Gary Vaynerchuk? Yeah. Anybody listen to the videos? So those of you who have, you know that he's a little bit off color. <laughs> He'll throw out an F-bomb on occasion, more than on occasion, actually. Um, and uh, he talks about wine. Actually, that's somebody that counts. I'm sorry? Yeah, that's somebody that actually counts numbers. Well, now you know you've made it when somebody are counting, <laughs> counting the, the number that you're throwing out there. Um, so basically what he does is he, he talks about um, the different types of wine, and he'll say, you know, he'll take a sip of wine, and he'll say, you know, that wine tastes like Skittles. And I'll say, you know, that, that wine tastes like um, sweaty socks, which, by the way, disturbs me that he knows what sweaty socks taste like. But he, he goes, he goes it, and he's very human about it, his experience, and he's, he's talking about wine. And he's done a very good job. He's grown his business from 5 million to 70 million and plus, and he's a big superstar, rock star, and, but he sells wine. That's mostly what he does. He's got a wine store, a couple of them. But here's his content, mission. His point of view is different. He's not talking about how he sells wine. He's talking about the wine experience. And think about this for your business. It's not what you sell. It's what you stand for, right? So he sells wine, right? So that's what, he's not talking about him selling wine. It's talking about that everyone deserves to understand the wine experience. And if you're a newbie wine drinker, like you're probably more sophisticated than us from Cleveland. 
Like, I think a good old screw top wine is, uh, is good, we're good to go with that. But I say, I don't know anything about that. So I'm sort of his audience, and I, just give me the basics of what it tastes like, what's good with what, and he'll do that. He gives you that educational experience. So everyone deserves to understand. Think about it from a bigger brand like a Southwest Airlines. If you look at it from Southwest, what's their content mission statement? What do they sell? They sell plane rides. That's not sexy. Just play, hey, get in a plane and go, right? That's not sexy. It was sexy like 30, 40 years ago, but not now. And what, but what's their promise? Their unique point of view is that everyone deserves to understand the flying experience, to, to, to be part of that, to have it special for them in some way. Uh, Virgin at, uh, America just launched in Dallas, and they, they, they hit that over the head. They'll say, hey, you can go fly with that. You go fly with American Airlines. You fly with us, you have a good time. That's the, they're trying to sell that experience. That's what their content is. Think about that from your perspective. Other opportunity is create your own category. Take your customer, you know, get all that feedback, all those pain points from your customers, and actually create something that hasn't been done before. Invent a story. Um, well, I wanna, this is a really good quote because I think this is why print will be around for a while. This is why there's an opportunity in different kinds of media because when we're online, when your customers are online and they know what they want, internet's fantastic, right? I know what I'm going to, I know what I need, I'm going to go find it as fast as I can, they're probably going to Google. But if you wanna learn, if you want to experience something a little bit different, uh, and video does this as well, um, you, you don't know what you know, you don't know what, what you wanna know yet. And that's what that tells, that's an opportunity there in different formats. So we tried this. Uh, with content marketing, uh, you know, we were talking out in the hall um, about, you know, nobody knew what content marketing was. We started using it in 2001. We went full force into it in 2007, put everything we had behind it. Nobody knew what it was. Nobody was using it, but we had enough information about what we felt our customers' pain points were, and I, I basically used every, you know, Hey, I uh, went into a marketer and I said, hey, well, so what's your custom publishing strategy? What's your custom content strategy? What's your branded content strategy? What's your, what's your corporate uh, content strategy? What's your customer media strategy? I used to throw them all out and they were all like glazed with all of them. And content marketing was like, oh, content marketing, is that where I market by creating my own content? Yeah, got it, content marketing, that's it. That's what we're gonna go after. And we did that and since doing that, Actually, the big line is custom, the blue line coming down is custom publishing. This is a tool called Google Insights. So I did this with um, custom publishing and content marketing. You'll see that the blue line, custom publishing, down, content marketing on its way up. I think if I refresh this, I think that content marketing is now overtaken. So there's an opportunity for something. We gotta think a little bit different and invent. GoToMeeting, anybody use GoToMeeting? Uh, virtual um, web meetings. GoToMeeting's done this with a site they called WorkShifting. What's WorkShifting? I never heard of WorkShifting before I got to this site. They created a WorkShifting.com and it's all targeted on people that make their offices, coffee shops, homes, they're all over the place. The whole idea of WorkShifting is that your office is anywhere. They created this out of thin air. They said, hey, let's call it WorkShifting. You know what? Over oh, two million results now, probably three million now for WorkShifting. And when anybody types in work shifting now, you know what they get? They get pages and pages and oodles of content from GoToMeeting. They dominate the space. So as more people start to call it that, they are there. They are the trusted experts. Number five, lack of a content calendar. And Russell, where's Russell going? Because I, I, I stole this from him. So this is, this is Russ's um, calendar that I talk about. And it's, it's a good sample plan of what you can do. There's no perfect way to do it. We're all different. We all have different budgets and resources. But if you put together a calendar, because where the breakdown happens in most companies, small, medium, or large, is they have this campaign mentality. It's like, oh, we got a new product or service, so I'm going to have, I've got content for three months. And then you know what? It stops. That's where you get some big uh, brands that do these microsites, and they have really good content for three months, and then they drop it off. But content, it's a, it's a promise. Creating content for your customers on a promise, and then you, if you do it for three months and you stop, you're like, oh, we broke our promise. We don't really care about you. That was our campaign. You didn't get that? So think about it from this perspective. He does it really well. One, seven, 30, four, two, one plan. So you need something. Yeah, that's really easy to remember. I know you'll be writing that down. Uh, daily, 
Twitter blog, a weekly you've got an e-newsletter, uh, monthly you might do a webinar for your customers, uh, quarterly maybe it's an e-book or a mini magazine, custom magazine, digital magazine, um, to biannual, biannual user event, one maybe it's a big research project or something like that. By the way, that research project I've been talking about, I, it didn't, it's, it was a lot of labor, it was very labor intensive, it wasn't a lot of money. I can't tell you the amount of mileage we've gotten off of that. I mean, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in business from that research project and it was just, it's just a research project. I mean, we can all do it because you just position yourself as the, as the expert. Um, give you an example then of, if you think about your schedule, is one thing, and then you've got to think about another thing is one piece of content isn't just one piece of content. It's not just, let's say, one content concept, and how can we repackage that, reuse it in different media channels that meet our goals and objectives? So this, what we did uh, with Ann Handley here, author of Content Rules, so we did a Q&A podcast. A lot of people in the past would think of, oh, okay, that's a podcast. We're going to do a podcast, send it out there, let people know about it, done, right? That podcast is tens and ten, you know, tons of content comes from that one piece of content. So what we did, we did multiple podcasts. We ended up with a print article, Q&A. We actually had multiple versions of that article, depending on which location it went to. A digital article, tweet schedule, Facebook posts go up on it. Uh, we have an extra blog post, guest posts, a white paper from that, and a, multi, and a case study that that content was used in. And we're going to probably use it more. But just think about that. It's like, you know, let's say you do an interview with a customer. How many th different ways could you use that? We think about, oh, we need a testimonial. Don't think about a testimonial. Think about all the fantastic things you could do with that content. Number six, not leveraging your employees. So how many of you let your uh, employees um, use Facebook and Twitter at work? Anybody? Let them go, right? Set them free. Set them free. OpenView uh, Venture Partners, a venture capitalist firm uh, out of Boston, what they did is they did an employee blog. Very, very tough to do this. These are the employees that started blogging. By the way, they didn't get everybody blogging at once. Um, they started with about 10, 15%. The ones that already had blogs and understood it, could do it, did some training, got them blogging, and now they have a lot of people blogging uh, for them. From that blog, they created OpenView Labs. So the whole idea, like what are they trying to do? Why, why do you do content? Their whole thing is they are trying to position themselves as the expert for um, expansion stage technology companies. So technology tech companies that are, let's say, at 10, 15, 20 million dollars, they need money to grow to the next level. That's what these guys are for. And so what they focus on OpenView Labs is all the problems that they're having, their business, how to get right management, succession planning, uh, financial strategies, whatever they do on OpenView Labs. So the blog content was the base of that and they've taken it to the next level. So they av actually average 24 pieces of content per week. That's a lot of content. They have over 90% of the employees blogging as part of this. That's pretty darn good. I think if you got the 10 or 15% in most companies, you'd be happy. Uh, they had 30,000 visits in the first six months which they're pretty happy with, but it's just visits, right? 25% open rate on their 3,000 e-newsletter subscribers. They're building their database. Didn't have a database. Now they're starting their database. And over 700 blogs, videos. They've got a whole video studio now that they created, full-blown publisher. And I asked Scott Maxwell, the CEO, I said, tell me, okay, you're doing all this content. What is it doing for your business? And Scott says, this is the biggest thing. It's helped us get some new companies in the pipeline, and they actually just... Uh, landed one and all that's good but he said here's the difference when somebody talk, comes to us which is more inbound than ever before he says I don't have to explain what I do they know instantly because they've already checked us out they've already found us they usually find us accidentally somebody's blogging about them or they find the content on the search engine and he says we are positioning ourselves as the leaders in this area we're the value add VC that will help you and they talk about that all day long on OpenView Labs, so big opportunity there. Number seven, that people will magically engage in your content. Some people think, hey, if we create a piece of content, people are just gonna magically find it. I gotta get another Lego in. <laughs> so, 
I want you to think about it from this. This happens all the time, big companies. They think if they put a piece of content and search engine optimized, people are just going to magically find it. And they don't need to talk about it. They don't need to put it in the right places. But think about it from this perspective. So it doesn't matter your religious background here, but this is a Jesus story. <laughs> so think about it this way. So this is Jesus, and he's going to the tax collector to you know, spread the word, right? Follow me. So let's say Jesus has this really good message and this really good story, but he stays uh, at home with Mary. And spreading the word in his own house with his mom and saying, Mom, nobody's following me. You know, nobody will listen to me. And she's like, well, get out the door and start talking about it. And that's the same exact thing. We've got to actually go to where our customers are at online. It's much more effective that way than just putting content out and saying, oh, I hope people are going to read that white paper. I hope, it's going to, I hope people are going to find that content. So find out where our customers are hanging out at, right? Do you have a hit list of the top 10 to 15 blogs in your industry for your small, medium, or large size business, for your association? Do you know who those people are that are talking about the things where your customers are at? If you don't, you need to get one, and you need to have somebody going to those places all the time consistently. Start reading them first. Once you read them, get active. You can start commenting, build relationships with those people. That's how we build our relationship. I think you comment on a blog, call, talk to each other. Uh, same thing with Kevin. I mean, same thing with Drew. I mean, we be, now we're all good friends. We're business partners. I mean, it, it's all working out really well. That's because we did this. Um, Kodak created a position called the Chief Listening Officer. Can you believe that? She created a position, Chief Listening Officer, and their job is, to, is like an air traffic control person for this. Who's talking about what, where, online, what do I need to do to get that information, and then where do I need to go? Customer service? Does it, where does it need to go? Your content has no owner. Who in your company is the storytelling owner of your message? Kodak, again, does this really well. They have a person called Jenny Chisney, uh, she's the uh, chief blogger. She manages their story. There are three blogs that they have. There's 17 Twitter accounts. There's people that do that, but she's the person that owns that content. Even in your small business, we don't have a lot of people, but who's the owner of the content, of the story for you? We need to have an owner, because if we don't, we're, we're not going to have any way to track that. <clears throat> you don't have any content experience. You hear that all the time. I don't know anything about stories. I don't know how to, you know, I know how to do that. The biggest problem for companies are creating engaging content. That's the biggest problem. Don't, I, I don't produce engaging content. So if that's the problem, what can you do? Hire a journalist. There you go. Right there. Hire. And you know what? Just like this, there's lots of journalists that are available, ready and willing to work with you. Um, we have a service called Junta42. We match people up with agencies, content agencies, same thing. Search out who are your internal content providers. Who are your internal experts? Care for them, caress them. Last one, don't have internal support. Maybe not as much for, so basically if you're the owner, operator, key person in your own company, you're good. You just have to be convinced and do this. If you're in a bigger company, it's hard. What we found out with the research, basically all you need to know by this stat is that it's 300% harder to do content marketing effectively if you don't have C-level support. That's all that this is saying. So basically, says if you don't have C-level support, CEO level type support, chief marketing officer level support, you're not going to be successful. So I want you to think about it. when you go from here, you're going to get a ton of really good ideas the rest of the day from some wonderful dynamic speakers. And I want you to think about your path to becoming a publisher. Uh, which it, you can't probably say that because people will make fun of you. But if you just think about it from that perspective and what do you need to do? Here are the 10 things. We'll go through them again. What are your goals? Are you on target? What is your super niche? What are your customer pain points? Are you, are you creating the best content in your niche? Because if you're not, you're not going to get attention. People aren't going to pay attention to you. They're not going to spread what you have to say through Twitter and Facebook and whatnot. Do you have a publishing schedule? That's consistency. You're not doing a campaign. Content is a promise. Employees are a key part of your content. Get your employees involved. Spread your content. Do you have an owner, chief content officer? Um, how are you insourcing? It's OK. Most companies outsource their content to somebody. You can insource it and outsource it. It's OK. And do you have senior level support? And that is it for me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I had a really good time. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>